Welcome back, everyone. In today's video, we're going to talk about onto functions. And so to start with, here's the definition of an onto function. Namely, a function from a set A to a set B is called onto if for every little b in big B, there exists a little a in big A, such that f of little a is equal to little b. Now, in terms of what this means about functions represented by these dot diagrams, I want to remind you that we had agreed that it's perfectly okay if a function does not use every output. So for example, in this case, whatever this output I've circled is, there is no input that used that output. And none of this stops this from being a function. However, what the additional constraint onto is saying is that in fact, yes, you have used every output. So this is an example of a function that is not onto. And so if I were to draw one that is onto, what I would need to do here is to make sure that I use every output. Or if you want that phrased purely in terms of arrows, what it means is there should be an arrow pointing at every element of B. The concept of being onto is actually quite closely related to the concept of image. Namely, if you look at this function over here, the not onto one, you'll see the image was these two dots. Whereas if you look at this one where it was onto, the image was all three dots. Remember, the image of a function is just the set of all the outputs that are actually used. And so in this case, when it was not onto, the image of the function happened to not be b. Whereas in this case, where it is onto, the image of f is b. And so you can note, and I guess this is a proposition, but it's almost a tautology, a function is onto if and only if its image is b. So in this way, we can relate this back to things that we've thought about before. Now, just like before, I think it's helpful if we also write down what it means for a function to not be onto. So in other words, what do I get if I negate this definition I've written down? So this for every becomes a there exists. This there exists becomes a for every. And then this f of a is equal to b becomes f of a is not equal to b. And if you liked framing this in terms of what it's saying about the image, this part here, that for every a and a, f of a is not equal to b, this is exactly saying that there exists a little b in b such that little b is not in the image of f. So that is a different way to say the same thing. So, to show a function is onto, we need to show that every element of the codomain is actually an output of the function. And to show that a function is not onto, we need to provide a specific element of the codomain that is not an output of the function. So let's start by jumping back to our favorite function. Is this function from r to r that takes x to x squared, is this function onto? So the answer is no, this function is not onto. And here's why. There exists a b and b, namely, I'm going to pick minus 7 in the codomain. And this minus 7 happens to have the property that for every little a and big A, we have f of a is not equal to b. Namely, for every little a in the domain, a squared is not minus 7. And so if you were to give someone a pithy summary, what's wrong with this function that makes it not onto? And the thing that makes this function not onto is that it never outputs a negative number because squares are always non-negative. Just like we talked about with one-to-one, -one, I want to really point out, before you can talk about whether a function's one-to-one -one or onto, you absolutely need to specify not just the map x squared, but also the domain and the codomain. And that's because I can make this function onto by just changing the codomain. So if I instead wrote down the function f from r to the closed interval from 0 to infinity that takes x to x squared, now suddenly this function is onto, because as we showed last time, in fact the image of this function 
is equal to the closed interval from zero to infinity. I'll do some more in-depth proofs of things being on to later, but for now, I just literally replaced what the codomain was, which was not the image, with the image, and that made the function on to. And in fact, that's something that you're always going to be able to do. So again, don't think of onto-ness or one-to-oneness as a property or none property of x squared. It's a property of the combination of the domain, the codomain, and x squared. Okay, so let's look at another function. Let's take f from z to z that takes n to 2n minus 1. Is this function onto? Now, let me frame that a different way. Instead of just asking, is this function onto, I could ask something like, can I think of a number in the codomain that could never be an output of this function? And if you look at it, I think you can, because what do you know about 2n minus 1? Well, 2n minus 1 is always odd. So this function is not onto, and why? 8 is in the codomain of f, but for every element in the domain, f of a is odd, so f of a is not 8. Again, I've showed this function is not onto by specifically giving you an element of the codomain that is not an element of the image. That is, the element 8 is here in the codomain, but no element in the domain maps to it. The reason, by the way, I keep writing codomain and domain instead of just z and z is because in these examples we've done the domain and codomain have been equal. And so I want to clarify sort of which z I'm viewing this 8 as being in. Namely, this 8 is living here, and then I'm saying there's no element here that maps to it. Here's a good example of a function. We can take the set of integers greater than or equal to 2. And we can send each element of the integers greater than or equal to 2 to the largest prime divisor of that number. So just for example, if you took g of 120, what would you get? Well, you could look at the factorization of 120 and see that the largest prime that divides 120 is 5. And so my question for you is, is this function on 2? Now, this is a function that's not given in the way you're probably used to functions being given, because I've given a text description, but this is a perfectly acceptable way to describe a function. And in fact, if you look at it, this function is definitely not onto. In fact, the way I can see that is that by definition, the output of this function is always prime. And there are plenty of numbers here that are not prime. So if I were to write that up, I would write something like no, say 12 is in the codomain of g, but definitely 12 is not the largest prime divisor of any number. And just to make sure the person who's reading this gets it, it's not prime. Take a moment and think about this one. So think about what this is describing, say in words what this function is doing, and then decide if you believe this function is onto or not. So what is this function doing? It's taking positive integers, two subsets of the positive integers. Remember, the power set is all the subsets of the positive integers. And it's taking each integer to the singleton set that contains this integer. So when I ask if this function's onto, what is it I'm really asking? I'm really asking, is every element of the power set of the positive integers, a singleton set. That is, can I write every subset of the positive integers as the singleton set containing a single positive integer? And the answer is definitely not. Again, what's going on here? The codomain is explicitly all subsets of the positive integers. But the function is only using as an output some subsets of the positive integers. And so, for example, the set 1, 2, 3 is an element of the codomain, 
but there's no positive integer such that the set that contains that positive integer n is equal to the set 1, 2, 3. This is f of n, by the way. That's where the singleton set that contained n is. One more note, check that you understand why this is an element symbol and not a subset symbol, even though this is a set. And the reason is because the power set is a set of sets, and this is one of those sets. So this is an element of, not a subset of, the power set of Z+. Here's another example with some power sets floating around, just to make sure we understand that this concept of being onto is really not related to particular sets of numbers or real numbers or anything of that sort. It can really apply to any sort of function. So here what's going on. Our domain in this case is the Cartesian product of the positive integers and the power set of positive integers. So what does an element of the Cartesian product of the positive integers and the power set of the positive integers look like? Well, as it would happen, it looks like a positive integer, comma, a subset of the positive integers. And that's why when I've gone to write an element here to describe the function, I have written that element as little a, comma, big B, just to emphasize to you and to myself that this thing is an integer, but this thing is a set. And then what are we going to do with that pair? We're going to take the union of B, the set, but we're going to toss in the element A. Note the set brackets here are strictly necessary. You cannot take a set union 2. This is not a supported operation. So I need set braces here, so that the thing I'm actually looking at is a set. So if you look at one of these functions, you might at first be inclined to think, well, I have no idea what this function's even doing. And so I think a good place to start, before you jump straight to, okay, I know the answer, and it's definitely this, which maybe you do, but sometimes you won't. And so if you're not sure what to do, what I recommend doing is to pick particular random elements of the codomain and ask yourself if they're in the image. So this is really scratch work here. But I'm just going to ask myself, say, is 1, 2, 7 in the image of this function? In other words, can I think of something that maps to the set 1, 2, 7? And as it would happen, yes. 1, 2, 7 happens to be the thing I get if I take g of 2 and 1, 7. Namely, what does g do? Again, it takes the set that is in the b slot, and then it throws in the element in the a slot. So when I take the set 1, 7, and then I throw in 2, I get 1, 2, 7. So that set, 1, 2, 7, is in the image. Now, that's in support of saying that this function is on to, but it's definitely not a proof that this function is on to. But it gets us to start thinking about the function so that we can understand it, and then hopefully write down a proof that it is on to or that it's not on to. Now, one thing you might notice that might be helpful is that I don't have to write this as g of 2, comma, the set 1, 7. I could actually write this in lots of ways. And maybe the simplest is actually that. So really, all I have to do in order to get out a particular set, if I think about it, is take an element of that set, comma, that set. So namely, if I want to show some set capital S is in the image of this function, all I have to do is choose an element little s that's in big S, and then take g of little s comma big S. And that will give me s, that will show me that s is in the image, and therefore the function's on to. But as so often happens, this very compelling argument that I've just given you contains a fatal flaw. And if you identify the fatal flaw, it also tells you why this isn't true. Namely, at one point, I said out loud, pick little s in big S. But when I say pick little s in big S, I'm making a secret assumption. Namely, what assumption am I making? 
I'm making the assumption that S is none empty. But I don't know that S is none empty. The empty set is definitely an element of the power set of Z plus. So if I'm going to claim that this functions onto, it needs to be the case that the empty set is in the image. Well, is the empty set in the image? And if I come over here, the answer is definitely no. Because there's no way I can take the union of this non-empty set and some hypothetical other set and get the empty set. And so after all of this scratch work, we can actually write down the answer, and the answer here turns out to be pretty short. This function is not on to y, and the reason is the empty set is in the codomain, but you never get the empty set as an output because the output g of a comma b is, remember, the set a union b, but that set can't be empty because it definitionally contains a. And thus, this ends up being a complete answer to show us that this function is not onto. By now, you have likely come to the conclusion that just like one-to-one, -one, it's easier to show functions are not onto than to show that a function is onto. And that's why so far, in all the examples we've done, we've happened to show that the function is not onto. But don't worry, we'll do examples where we show a function is onto as well. So let's start with a relatively straightforward function. Let's start with this function from the reals to the reals that takes x to 3x minus 2. And I want to show this function's onto. And remember, anytime we're trying to prove that some particular definition applies, the definition tells us how to prove it. Namely, what do I need? I need to show that for every little b in big B, there exists a little a in big A such that f of a is equal to b. So I need to show that for every element of the codomain, there exists an element in the domain that maps to it. Now, you might recall, we've actually done quite a few of these for every there exists kind of proofs before. A lot of that was for preparation for the definition of onto. And so one thing you might remember about these for every there exists kind of proofs is that almost always they require some amount of scratch work. And so I am going to unashamedly jump into scratch work mode here. And I'm going to think about what is it that I'm trying to do. Namely, I'm trying to get f of a to equal b. And I know what f of a is. f of a is 3a minus 2. I'm trying to get that to equal b. And so what does that mean? That means 3a is b plus 2. So it means a is b plus 2 over 3. Now, here's a check your understanding question. Why does what I just wrote down have to be in scratch work? Why can I not have written that as part of the proof? The answer that I hope you said is that when I start here, I'm assuming the thing that I'm trying to prove. So when I do this, I'm really working backwards. And I can't write down my logic backwards in a proof. I can't start with the thing I'm trying to prove and work backwards. So I'm going to need to use this a equals b plus 2 over 3 in my proof, and you'll see where it comes up. But in the proof, this a equals b plus 2 over 3 is going to appear to have come out of nowhere. And where did it really come from? It really came from this piece of scratch work. We're just not going to include this scratch work in our answer. So let's write down the actual proof. So I want to show again that for every little b in the reals, there exists a little a in the reals such that f of little a is equal to b. So to start with, I'm going to need to let b be a real number. This is a for every statement. And so I don't get to pick what little b is. I have to let little b be chosen by the spirits or whatever. 
This is an arbitrary little b, is how a lot of mathematicians would like to think about this. When I'm saying let little b be an element of r, I'm really again saying just pick one, but it can be any one. I don't need anything specific. And now I also need to say what my a is. And I could say let a be an element of r, but then I'm picking a random element of r to be a, and I can't do that because I need it to be the case that f of little a is equal to b. So in fact, I need to declare specifically what little a is. Namely, I need to declare specifically that little a is b plus 2 over 3. Again, if you're reading this proof, it might look slightly strange. Where did this come from? But you don't need to justify it, you can let A be anything you want, as long as everything is going to work out. So, the scratch work, again, need not be part of what you turn in. In fact, really, you should not turn in the scratch work piece. You should really just turn in the written up proof. So what is it I now need to do? To complete this proof, I need to show you that f of A is equal to B. And so remember, when I'm trying to show an equality, I start with considering one of the sides of the inequality and working towards the other. Almost always you want to start with the more complicated side of the equality and work towards the simpler side. You don't have to do that, but usually it's easier. And so in this case, the more complicated side is f of a, so I'm going to start with that. So f of a is, and so what is it? It's 3a minus 2, and because a is b plus 2 over 3, this is 3 times b plus 2 over 3 minus 2. And that would be b plus 2 minus 2. And that will be b. Thus, what I've shown is that f of little a, in fact, is little b. And so this is what my proof that for every little b in the reals, there's a little a in the reals such that f of little a is equal to little b is going to look like. I want to show this is a property of every real number. So I let b be an arbitrary real number. And then the claim is that for that real number, there's something I can put into the function that will give me back b. And so to do that, I say, hey, not only is there something, I'm going to tell you what it is. Classic way we prove a there exists statement by giving an example. And then I show you that, hey, once you plug that in, blah, 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 and the B falls out, and that's what I wanted. If I had not gotten to this equals B, that would be a serious problem. It would mean that I missed something somewhere and would mean that I needed to go back and re-look at my logic because maybe it didn't work out. So here's a function that we looked at in our video on one-to-one -one functions. Namely, we took a pair of positive integers, p, q, and we sent it to just p divided by q. And so that will give me a positive real number. And so in the one-to-one -one video, we saw that this was not one-to-one, -one, and the reason it was not one-to-one -one ended up ultimately involving that not all fractions are written in lowest terms, or something like that. But now I'm asking a different question. Namely, now I'm asking the question, can I get every positive rational number out of this? Is there some input, p comma q, where p over q is going to be equal to the rational number? And... The answer here is yes, and in fact, the answer here is actually going to be pretty easy once you think carefully about what it means to be a rational number. So here's what the proof is going to look like. So what do I need to do? I need to start by picking an element of the codomain. So being a positive rational number, what does it mean? It means that this number can be written as a fraction. So my positive rational number here, it can be written in the form m over n. But that actually tells me what it is I need to put into the function in order to get out b. Namely, I need to put in m comma n. So if little a is the ordered pair m comma n, then f of little a is, well, by definition, m over n, and that's b. 
And that's what we wanted. So what I did here was to show you that every positive rational number is an output of this function. So here's another function we've talked about before. We've got here the set of all subsets of the positive integers except the empty set. And the reason why I'm throwing away the empty set is because the function I want to take is to take the minimum element of each subset. And so in this instance, I'm just sending a set to its minimum element, and only the empty set doesn't have a minimum element out of the subsets of the positive integers. So this is a well-defined function as long as I remember this piece, which was a lot of our discussion when we talked about this function last time. But while we're looking at this now, go ahead and ask yourself, is this function on to? And again, it will happen here that the answer is yes. So I need to let b be a positive integer, that is an element of the codomain, and I need to show you that I can make up an element in the domain that gives b as an output. In other words, I need to show you that there's a subset of the positive integers whose minimum element is little b. So I'll do that this way, and I'll note Normally, I would call the element of the domain that's going to map to my little b, I would normally call it little a. But now I'm calling it big A. Why? Because it's a set. Every element of the domain here is a set. And so as a result, I'm going to use a set-like way of writing it. So there is no special thing about the letters little a and little b. You can use whatever letters you want, whatever helps you keep track of what's going on. And so I'm going to use a capital letter because I'm going to write down a set. And the set I'm going to write down is the set b, b plus 1, b plus 2, and so on. That is all the numbers equal to b or larger than b. And why did I choose this set? Because when I then go down to write the minimum of a, it's pretty clear, I think, that the minimum element of this set is little b. But this is exactly what I wanted to show. And so I'm done. I showed you that I can write down an element in the domain that maps to any element I want in the codomain. Now, where did I come up with this? Well, I just thought to myself, what would be an example of a set whose minimum element is little b? But this is far from the only option. So I think a very natural choice that you might have chosen instead is to let the set a just be the set that contains little b. And so now it is very clear that when I take the minimum of the set little b, well, it only has the element little b, so that's definitely the smallest element in it, and so this would also work. So whichever of these you like, or you could go somewhere in between and take a to be something like b, b plus 1, b plus 8, that would also work. There are a great many choices here for how you write this proof. All you have to do is come up with something that's going to depend on little b, but a formula for something, in this case a formula for a set, whose minimum is going to be little b. Let's do an example with the potential to be difficult to think about again. So I've got a function here that starts in the power set of z+. Plus. That is, it starts with a subset of the positive integers, and then lands in the power set of the power set of z+. Plus. And the way we get from the power set of z+, plus to the power set of the power set of z+, plus is that whatever thing we start with in the power set of z+, plus, I take the power set of it. So this would be a fantastic point to pause the video and think about this before you go on to make sure you're getting how all of these concepts click together. So this is definitely not one where you can look at it and immediately go, oh yeah, I see what's going on, because this is going to take a bit to think about. So let's just write down what are elements here. They're subsets of the positive integers. And so what are elements here? Elements here are sets of subsets of the positive integers. So like in the last example where it was a little hard to understand what was going on, I might just pick a very random element of the codomain. So in this case, uh, what are some sets? 
of positive integers. Well, I could take 1, 2, 3, 7, and 5, 8, 9. And let's throw in 1, 2, 3 as well. All I did here was pick a really random looking element of the codomain. And so what I'm encouraging you to do when you have no idea whether the answer is going to be that this thing is onto or not onto or whatever, is just write down some random element of the codomain and ask yourself, is this element in the image? And so I'll ask you, is this random set that I've written down in the image? And it might take you a bit of thought, but I think if you remember what a power set is, and remember the things we've said about power sets, you'll realize pretty quickly there's no way this can be in the image of the function. Why not? Because the things in the image of the function are in fact all power sets. And this cannot be the power set of anything. So here's why. This B I've written down, it's in the codomain, but there can't be anything that maps to it. Because if A is any set that you like in the domain, then F of A is by definition the power set of A, that's just the definition of F. That can't be B. Why? Because definitely the empty set is an element of this side of the equal sign, and the empty set is definitely not an element of this side of the equal sign. And so it can't be possible that these two things are equal, and so this function is not on to. Now, those of you with an eye for detail might be inclined to ask yourself, why did I call this little b when it's a set instead of big B? And there is no good reason. Uh, I just chose something and then I just happened to call it little b, so whatever. These are conventions to help us keep track of things. You're not required to adhere to the notation um, at least in math, you're usually not required to adhere to the notation, it just usually helps keep track of what's going on. Okay, so let's take a look at this now. Let's ask, if I take this function from the integers cross the integers to the integers cross the integers that takes an ordered pair of integers m, n, and sends it to m plus 3n, comma 2m plus 5n, and my question is, is this going to be on to? And again, I really want to stress, it should not be obvious to you whether this is onto or not. And I could change these numbers just by a little bit and completely change the answer about whether this is onto or not. So you should not feel bad if you look at this and think to yourself, well, gee, I have no idea. That is probably what you should think for most of these questions when you look at them first. You have to look at them and study them and get some intuition for them before the truth sort of emerges from your study. Again, what am I going to do if I really don't know the answer? I'm going to just choose a random-ish element of the codomain. So that is, I'm looking for a random-ish pair of integers. And so I will pick, say, 711. And so this is, again, just sort of a way of priming yourself to think about this question. Ask yourself, is this in the image of f? And we hope that by answering this question, we'll get enough of a sense of what's going on that maybe we can really prove the answer. So again, there's sort of three possibilities, all of which are good for us. One is this isn't in the image, in which case, great, the function's not on two and we're done. Second is this is in the image, and as a result of showing it's in the image, we actually understand how to show that an arbitrary element is in the image, in which case the function is on two, and great. Or the third option is that we now understand what the function's doing, and this is in the image, but we see why this is in the image, but something else might not be, in which case the function is not one to. So really, we're just sort of doing this and seeing where it goes. So I'm imagining, okay, something here, some m comma n maps to 711. What does that m comma n look like? Well, this thing is m plus 3n comma 2m plus 5n, and this is 7 comma 11. And we talked about this kind of thing back in the section on calculating whether things were in the image or not. What is this really saying? 
This is really saying m plus 3n is equal to 7, and 2m plus 5n is equal to 11. And so really, when I'm looking for an mn that map to this, I'm really looking for a solution to this system of equations. Now, as I said before, often the best way to solve a system of equations is to combine the equations you're given in some fashion. Uh, and so you could do this by substitution or by combining these two things. Uh, I did it by combining them last time. Let's do it by substitution this time. So what's m? m is 7 minus 3n. That's just solving m here. And then I can plug that in. And so upon plugging that in, I'm going to get 2 times 7 minus 3n plus 5n equals 11. And so that says 14 minus 6n plus 5n is equal to 11. So minus n is minus 3. So n is 3. And m is... 7 minus 3 times 3, so minus 2. And so we think we've shown that 711 is in the image, namely it's, we think we've shown that if I take f of minus 2 comma 3, I should get 711. Let's check. Minus 2 plus 3 times 3, that's 7. Great. Minus 2 times 2 is minus 4, plus 15, that's 11. Great. So 711 really is in the image. Now, I have to say, leveling with you, this is about as little information as I could possibly have gotten. Because I did learn that this thing is in the image. But it's not super clear how we got from 711 to minus 2, 3. And so it's not clear that this would work if I picked another pair. But it's certainly not clear from this, like, what could go wrong exactly. And so here, in order to actually answer this question, I have to be willing to solve a slightly more general system of equations. So in what I just did, I started with 7, 11. Instead of that, Let's ask ourselves if c, d is in the image. Now, wh why do I think that's a good idea? Well, it worked for 7, 11, so I don't think there's any obvious flaws. And so my hope is that if I try and figure out what would map to c, d, either I'll find a formula for it, in which case that formula can slot straight into my proof that this function's onto, or when I find the formula for c, d, maybe it will be clear that there's holes or that for some reason it doesn't work. In which case, hooray, I'm done then too. Okay, so what is it I'm doing? I'm trying to solve f of mn equals c, d. Note this c, d, this is really my little b here. But I'm, instead of just writing little b, I'm actually spelling out the x and y coordinates of my element of the codomain. So that is to say, I'm really trying to figure out if c, d can be equal to m plus 3n, 2m plus 5n. So I'm going to rewrite that as a system of equations. And now there are lots of variables floating around. And so I have to make sure I'm careful to remember what is it I'm solving for here. The thing I'm solving for here is the m comma n, right? I want to know if something maps to c comma d. Also, if I was solving for c comma d, I would kind of already be done because they're already written there. So I want to solve in this instance for m comma n. How am I going to do that? Well, fortunately, I could do it in exactly the same way that I solved for m and n in this example above. Namely, I'll start by solving the first equation for m, so that will give me m is equal to c minus 3n, and then I can plug that in to 2m plus 5n equals d. 
So that will give me 2 times c minus 3n plus 5n equals d, which will give me 2c minus 6n plus 5n equals d. And so that will give me minus n is equal to d minus 2c, or n is 2c minus d. And then m is supposed to be c minus 3n, so this will be c minus 6c minus 3d, which will be c minus 6c plus 3d, which will be minus 5c plus 3d. So what do I think I've done? I think I've figured out the things that would have to map to c comma d. But logically, what have I actually done? It's important to remember. What I've actually done is to start by assuming that the thing I'm looking for exists, and then figure out if it exists, what it is. So I definitely do not have a proof of any sort here that a solution exists yet. But I have a good idea if the solution exists, what it is. Namely, it's supposed to be this m comma n. Now, a good hint if you want to make sure that things have gone correctly, is that we already did this in the case 711, and we got minus 2, 3, you could make sure that we actually get minus 2, 3 out of this pair if I put in c is 7 and d is 11. So if c is 7, this is 14, minus 11 is 3. If I put in c equals 7, this is minus 35 plus 33, that'll be minus 2. And so I did get the same thing. So that is just reason to think that I've probably done this correctly. Now, all of this ultimately leads to a very short proof. So here's how our proof goes. We're just going to suppose, again, we have an element of the codomain. Then we're going to describe this specific element of the domain. And then we're going to calculate f of that specific element. And so what is f of this specific element going to be? It's going to be m plus 3n. So that is minus 5c plus 3d plus 3 times n, so plus 3 times 2c minus d. And that's the first slot, comma, and then what's the second slot going to be? The second slot is going to be 2m, so that is 2 times minus 5c plus 3d, and then plus 5 times n, which is going to be 2c minus d. And let me simplify this. So this is going to, in the first slot, be minus 5c plus 3d plus 6c minus 3d, comma, and then in the second slot, it's going to be minus 10c plus 6d plus 10c minus 5d. And so this looks like a humongous mess, but... If you actually now look at what happens, this is exactly C comma D, like it's supposed to be. And I want to emphasize, only now have we completed this proof. Because now we've shown that for this particular input, if I plug that into the function, I get out C comma D. Everything worked out. But in particular, this means that when you write up the answer to this question, it really is this short. There's nothing else to say. Once you've written this down, no one can really argue with you. The function's on to. It just so happens you're not going to get to this kind of proof without doing a lot of scratch work on the side to figure out this minus 5c plus 3d comma 2c minus d business. I want to talk a little bit about notation and terminology for one-to-one -one and onto functions. And then I also want to talk about what happens with onto functions in finite sets. And then we'll be in good shape for the day. So, in terms of notation, sometimes people show that a function is one-to-one -one or onto by modifying the arrow that goes from A to B. 
So you will see some faculty members and some books will put like this kind of curved arrow to indicate that a function is one to one. And people will do a similar thing with this sort of double headed arrow to indicate that a function is on to. I will usually not do either of these things, although what you'll occasionally see me do if you watch me very closely is occasionally I will say a function is one to one, and then just to reiterate that fact, I will also use a swoopy arrow or likewise for a function that is on to. Anyway, I don't find these particularly offensive. I just usually don't use them unless it's just a sort of a mnemonic to remind myself of something being one to one or one to. On the other hand, the following thing that people do drives me crazy. Uh, so when we say we're defining a function, we'll say we have a function f from a to b. If someone wants to be especially lazy and they want to say that that function is on to, they'll say from a on to b. Or if they want to say that that function is one to one, they'll sometimes say from a into b. And so this is kind of transparently sneaking the word onto into the language. And so this is telling you in a very easy to miss way that the function's onto, uh, whereas this into is meant to go with the word injective. And so this is meant to tell you that the function is one to one. If you are writing, and you expect any other person's eyes to ever be on the thing you're writing, do not do this. Because it is very easy to miss, and I have lost combined hours of my life trying to understand what was going on because I missed one of these little signifier words snuck in a textbook somewhere. I'll also note it's not only good to be writing things well or clearly if someone else is going to be looking at them, it's also good to do it if you're going to be looking at them in the future. Because as much as I pick on things other people do, I also spend a great deal of time looking at my own mathematical writing from five or ten years ago, trying to figure out what on earth is going on, and being like, I can't believe I wrote it this way, this was awful, and now I don't understand what I'm saying, and so I have to go back and figure it out. Anyway, good writing is worth the effort. That is the moral of the story. Last up, we have to talk about the Pigeonhole Principle Part 2. I'll remind you what the Pigeonhole Principle Part 1 said, and then I'll let you guess what the Pigeonhole Principle Part 2 says. So this is a reminder, this was the Pigeonhole Principle Part 1. If I started with two finite sets, and again, I'll remind you, all Pigeonhole Principles only apply to finite sets, then the existence of a one-to-one -one function from A to B was an if-and-only-if statement with the size of A being less than or equal to the size of B. And we could see this more or less from the dot diagrams that we could draw for finite sets. Namely, it being one-to-one -one meant that no two arrows from elements of A could point at the same element of B. And so that meant if A had some number of elements, there needed to be at least that many elements in B for those arrows to point at. So, what's the pigeonhole principle part two going to say? Well, one change is that I'm going to replace the words one to one with on to. Now, think about this condition for one to one. What does this condition have to be for on to functions? And I think you won't have too hard of a time convincing yourself that in order for a function to be on to between finite sets, it needs to be the case that the size of A is larger than or equal to the size of B. So in other words, the word one to one flipped to the word on to and the direction of this inequality flipped. Again, just to think about it, why is it that the size of A needs to be greater than or equal to the size of B? Well, if I think about B here, and I think it, about what it means for a function to be on to, it means there needs to be an arrow pointing at each of these dots, wherever that arrow happens to have come from. But if there's five dots here, these five arrows have to have come from five different places. 
why do the five arrows have to have come from five different places? That's because in a function, exactly one arrow originates from each dot. And so there have to be at least as many dots over here in A as there are in B. Now, it's no problem at all to throw more dots into A, because those more dots will only give us more arrows, and those arrows will likewise still point at dots of B, but these extra dots in A, leading to these extra arrows in B, don't make this function any less onto. But the point is, in order for it to be onto, there have to be at least as many arrows as there are elements of B, but the number of arrows is the number of elements of A. That's the punchline. Just a tiny bit of foreshadowing. What does the pigeonhole principle tell you if there's both a one-to-one -one function and an onto function from a finite set A to a finite set B? Well, in that instance, it would tell you that the size of A was less than or equal to the size of B, but also that the size of A was greater than or equal to the size of B, and that will tell you that the size of A is in fact actually equal to the size of B. And so, preview, that will be the third pigeonhole principle. But I think it is best to leave our discussion of onto functions here. In the next video, as I said before, we're going to talk about functions that are bijections, that is functions that are both one-to-one -one and onto, and so, Fear not, there'll be more examples of showing that functions are one-to-one -one and or onto in that video, because we'll need to do both a handful of times. But that's all for now. I'll see you next time.